Story seven of Round the Fire Stories by Arthur Conan Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story seven Playing with Fire. I cannot pretend to say what occurred on the fourteenth of April last at number seventeen Batterley Gardens. Put down in black and white, my surmise might seem too crude, too grotesque for serious consideration and yet that something did occur and that it was of a nature which will leave its mark upon every one of us for the rest of our lives is as certain as the unanimous testimony of five witnesses can make it i will not enter into any argument or speculation i will only give a plain statement which will be submitted to john moyer harvey deacon and mrs delamere and withheld from publication unless they are prepared to corroborate every detail i cannot obtain the sanction of paul le duc for he appears to have left the country it was john moir the well-known senior partner of moir and moir and sanderson who had originally turned our attention to occult subjects he had like many very hard and practical men of business a mystic side to his nature which had led him to the examination and eventually to the acceptance of those elusive phenomena which are grouped together with much that is foolish and much that is fraudulent under the common heading of spiritualism his researches which had begun with an open mind ended unhappily in dogma and he became as positive and fanatical as any other bigot he represented in our little group the body of men who have turned these singular phenomena into a new religion mrs delamere our medium was his sister the wife of delamere the rising sculptor our experience had shown us that to work on these subjects without a medium was as futile as for an astronomer to make observations without a telescope on the other hand the introduction of a paid medium was hateful to all of us was it not obvious that he or she would feel bound to return some result for money received and that the temptation to fraud would be an overpowering one no phenomena could be relied upon which were produced at a guinea an hour but fortunately moir had discovered that his sister was mediumistic in other words that she was a battery of that animal magnetic force which is the only form of energy which is subtle enough to be acted upon from the spiritual plane as well as from our own material one of course when i say this i do not mean to beg the question but i am simply indicating the theories upon which we were ourselves rightly or wrongly explaining what we saw the lady came not altogether with the approval of her husband and though she never gave indications of any very great psychic force we were able at least to obtain those usual phenomena of message tilting which are at the same time so puerile and so inexplicable every sunday evening we met at harvey deacon's studio at batterley gardens the next house to the corner of merton park road harvey deacon's imaginative work in art would prepare any one to find that he was an ardent lover of everything which was outre and sensational a certain picturesqueness in the study of the occult had been the quality which had originally attracted him to it but his attention was speedily arrested by some of those phenomena to which i have referred and he was coming rapidly to the conclusion that what he had looked upon as an amusing romance and an after-dinner entertainment was really a very formidable reality he is a man with a remarkably clear and logical brain a true descendant of his ancestor the well-known scotch professor and he represented in our small circle the critical element the man who has no prejudices is prepared to follow facts as far as he can see them and refuses to theorize in advance of his data his caution annoyed moir as much as the latter's robust faith amused deacon but each in his own way was equally keen upon the matter and i what am i to say that i represented i was not the devotee i was not the scientific critic perhaps the best that i can claim for myself is that i was the dilettante man about town anxious to be in the swim of every fresh movement thankful for any new sensation which would take me out of myself and open up fresh possibilities of existence 
I am not an enthusiast myself, but I like the company of those who are. Morris' talk, which made me feel as if we had a private passkey through the door of death, filled me with a vague contentment. The soothing atmosphere of the séance with the darkened lights was delightful to me. In a word, the thing amused me, and so I was there. It was, as I have said, upon the 14th of April last that the very singular event which I am about to put upon record took place. I was the first of the men to arrive at the studio, but Mrs. Delamere was already there, having had afternoon tea with Mrs. Harvey Deacon. The two ladies and Deacon himself were standing in front of an unfinished picture of his upon the easel. I am not an expert in art, and I have never professed to understand what Harvey Deacon meant by his pictures, but I could see in this instance that it was all very clever and imaginative, fairies and animals and allegorical figures of all sorts. The ladies were loud in their praises, and indeed the color effect was a remarkable one. "'What do you think of it, Markham?' he asked. "'Well, it's above me,' said I. "'These beasts, what are they?' "'Mythical monsters, imaginary creatures, heraldic emblems, a sort of weird, bizarre procession of them, with a white horse in front.' "'It's not a horse,' said he, rather testily, which was surprising, for he was a very good-humoured fellow as a rule, and hardly ever took himself seriously. "'Well, what is it, then? Can't you see the horn in front? It's a unicorn. I told you they were heraldic beasts. Can't you recognise one?' "'Oh, very sorry, Deacon,' said I, for he really seemed to be annoyed. He laughed at his own irritation. "'Oh, excuse me, Markham,' said he. "'The fact is that I have had an awful job over the beast. All day I have been painting him in and painting him out and trying to imagine what a real, live, ramping unicorn would look like. At last I got him, as I hoped, so when you failed to recognize it, it took me on the raw. "'Why, of course it's a unicorn,' said I, for he was evidently depressed at my obtuseness. "'I can see the horn quite plainly.' but I never saw a unicorn except beside the royal arms, and so I never thought of the creature. And these others are griffins and cockatrices and dragons of sorts? Yes, I had no difficulty with them. It was the unicorn which bothered me. However, there's an end of it until tomorrow. He turned the picture round upon the easel, and we all chatted about other subjects. Moyer was late that evening, and when he did arrive he brought with him, rather to our surprise, a small stout Frenchman, whom he introduced as Monsieur Paul Le Duc. I say to our surprise, for we held a theory that any intrusion into our spiritual circle deranged the conditions and introduced an element of suspicion. We knew that we could trust each other, but all our results were vitiated by the presence of an outsider. However, Moyer soon reconciled us to the innovation. Monsieur Paul Le Duc was a famous student of occultism, a seer, a medium, and a mystic. He was travelling in England with a letter of introduction to Moyer from the president of the Parisian Brothers of the Rosy Cross. What more natural than that he should bring him to our little séance, or that we should feel honoured by his presence? He was, as I have said, a small, stout man, undistinguished in appearance, with a broad, smooth, clean-shaven face, remarkable only for a pair of large brown velvety eyes, staring vaguely out in front of him. He was well-dressed, with the manners of a gentleman, and his curious little turns of English speech set the lady smiling. Mrs. Deacon had a prejudice against our researches, and left the room, upon which we lowered the lights, as was our custom, and drew up our chairs to the square mahogany table which stood in the centre of the studio. The light was subdued, but sufficient to allow us to see each other quite plainly. I remember that I could even observe the curious podgy little square-topped hands which the Frenchman laid upon the table. "'What a fun!' said he. "'It is many years since I have sat in this fashion, and it is to me so amusing. Madame is medium. Does Madame make the trance?' "'Well, hardly that,' said Mrs. Delamere. "'But I am always conscious of extreme sleepiness.' 
it is the first stage then you encourage it and uh, there comes the trance then the trance comes and then out jumps your little spirit and in jumps another little spirit and uh, so you have direct talking or writing you leave your machine to be worked by another eh but what have unicorns to do with it harvey deacon started in his chair the frenchman was moving his head slowly round and staring into the shadows which draped the walls what a fun said he always unicorns who has been thinking so hard upon a subject so bizarre this is wonderful cried deacon i have been trying to paint one all day but how could you know it you have been thinking of them in this room certainly but thoughts are things my friend when you imagine a thing you make a thing you did not know eh? Huh? but i can see your unicorns because it is not only with my eyes did i can see do you mean to say that i create a thing which has never existed by merely thinking of it but certainly it is the fact which lies under all other facts that is why an evil thought is also a danger they are i suppose upon the astral plane said moore oh well these are but words my friends they are there somewhere everywhere i cannot tell myself i see them i could not touch them you could not make us see them it is to materialize them oh it is an experiment but the power is wanting let us see what power we have and then arrange what we shall do may i place you as i should wish you evidently know a great deal more about it than we do said harvey deacon i wish that you would take complete control it may be that the conditions are not good but we will try what we can do madame will sit where she is i next and this is gentleman beside me mr moore will sit next to madame because it is well to have blacks and blondes in turn so and now with your permission i will turn the lights all out what is the advantage of the dark i asked because the force with which we deal is a vibration of ether and so also is light we have the wires all for ourselves now eh you will not be frightened in the darkness madame what a fun is such a seance at first the darkness appeared to be absolutely pitchy but in a few minutes our eyes became so far accustomed to it that we could just make out each other's presence very dimly and vaguely it is true i could see nothing else in the room only the black loom of the motionless figures we were all taking the matter much more seriously than we had ever done before you will place your hands in front it is hopeless that we touch since we are so few round so large a table you will compose yourself madame and if sleep should come to you you will not fight against it and now we sit in silence and we expect eh so we sat in silence and expected staring out into the blackness in front of us a clock ticked in the passage a dog barked intermittently far away once or twice a cab rattled past in the street and the gleam of its lamps through the chink in the curtains was a cheerful break in that gloomy vigil i felt those physical symptoms with which previous seances had made me familiar the coldness of the feet the jingling in the hands the glow of the palms the feeling of a cold wind upon the back strange little shooting pains came in my forearms especially as it seemed to me in my left one which was nearest to our visitor due no doubt to disturbance of the vascular system but worthy of some attention all the same at the same time i was conscious of a strained feeling of expectancy which was almost painful from the rigid absolute silence of my companions i gathered that their nerves were as tense as my own and then suddenly a sound came out of the darkness a low sibilant sound the quick thin breathing of a woman quicker and thinner yet it came as between clenched teeth to end in a loud gasp with a dull rustle of cloth what's that is all right asked someone in the darkness yes all is right said the frenchman it is madame she is in her trance and now gentlemen if you will wait quiet you will see something i think which will interest you much still the ticking in the hall still the breathing deeper and fuller now from the medium 
still the occasional flash more welcome than ever of the passing lights of the hansoms what a gap we were bridging the half-raised veil of the eternal on the one side and the cabs of london on the other the table was throbbing with a mighty pulse it swayed steadily rhythmically with an easy swooping scooping motion under our fingers sharp little raps and cracks came from its substance file firing volley firing the sounds of a faggot burning briskly on a frosty night there is much power said the frenchman see it on the table i had thought it was some delusion of my own but all could see it now there was a greenish-yellow phosphorescent light or i should say a luminous vapour rather than a light which lay over the surface of the table it rolled and wreathed and undulated in dim glimmering folds turning and swirling like clouds of smoke i could see the white square-ended hands of the french medium in this baleful light what a fun he cried it is splendid shall we call the alphabet asked moir oh but no for we can do much better said our visitor it is but a clumsy thing to tilt the table for every letter of the alphabet and with such a medium as madame we should do better than that yes you will do better said a voice who was that who spoke was that you markham no i did not speak it was madame who spoke but it was not her voice is that you mrs delamere it is not the medium but it is the power which uses the organs of the medium said the strange deep voice where is mrs delamere it will not hurt her i trust the medium is happy and in another plane of existence she has taken my place as i have taken hers who are you it cannot matter to you who i am i am one who has lived as you are living and who has died as you will die we heard the creak and grate of a cab pulling up next door there was an argument about the fare and the cabman grumbled hoarsely down the street the green-yellow cloud still swirled faintly over the table dull elsewhere but glowing into a dim luminosity in the direction of the medium it seemed to be piling itself up in front of her a sense of fear and cold struck into my heart it seemed to me that lightly and flippantly we had approached the most real and august of sacraments that communion with the dead of which the fathers of the church had spoken don't you see that we are going too far should we not break up this seance i cried but the others were all earnest to see the end of it they laughed at my scruples all the powers are made for use said harvey deacon if we can do this we should do this every new departure of knowledge has been called unlawful in its inception it is right and proper that we should inquire into the nature of death it is right and proper said the voice there what more could you ask cried moir who was much excited let us have a test will you give us a test that you are really there what test do you demand well now i have some coins in my pocket will you tell me how many we come back in the hope of teaching and of elevating and not to guess childish riddles ah oh, mr moyer you catch it that time cried the frenchman more well, truly this is very good sense what the control is saying it is a religion not a game said the cold hard voice exactly the very view i take of it cried moir i am sure i am very sorry if i have asked a foolish question you will not tell me who you are what does it matter have you been a spirit long yes how long we cannot reckon time as you do our conditions are different are you happy yes you would not wish to come back to life no certainly not are you busy we could not be happy if we were not busy what do you do i have said that the conditions are entirely different can you give us no idea of your work we labor for our own improvement and for the advancement of others do you like coming here to-night i am glad to come if i can do any good by coming then to do good is your object 
it is the object of all life on every plane you see markham that would answer your scruples it did for my doubts had passed and only interest remained have you pain in your life i asked no pain is a thing of the body have you mental pain yes one may always be sad or anxious do you meet the friends whom you have known on earth some of them why only some of them only those who are sympathetic do husbands meet wives those who have truly loved and the others they are nothing to each other there must be a spiritual connection of course is what we are doing right if done in the right spirit what is the wrong spirit curiosity and levity may harm come of that very serious harm what sort of harm you may call up forces over which you have no control evil forces undeveloped forces you say they are dangerous dangerous to body or mind sometimes to both there was a pause and the blackness seemed to grow blacker still while the yellow-green fog swirled and smoked upon the table any questions you would like to ask more said harvey deacon only this do you pray in your world one should pray in every world why because it is the acknowledgment of forces outside ourselves what religion do you hold over there we differ exactly as you do you have no certain knowledge we have only faith these questions of religion said the frenchman they are of interest to you serious english people but they are not so much fun it seems to me that with this power here we might be able to have some great experience eh? something of which we could talk but nothing could be more interesting than this said moir well if you think so that is very well the frenchman answered peevishly for my part it seems to me that i have heard all this before and that to-night i should wish to try some experiment with all this force which is given to us but if you have other questions then ask them and when you finish we can try something more but the spell was broken we asked and asked but the medium sat silent in her chair only her deep regular breathing showed that she was there the mist still swirled upon the table you have disturbed the harmony she will not answer but we have learned already all that she can tell eh? for my part i wish to see something i've never seen before what then you will let me try what would you do i have said to you that thoughts are things now i wish to prove it to you and to show you that which is only a thought yes yes i can do it and you will see now i ask you only to sit still and say nothing and to keep your hands quiet upon the table the room was blacker and more silent than ever the same feeling of apprehension which had lain heavily upon me at the beginning of the seance was back at my heart once more the roots of my hair were tingling it is working it is working cried the frenchman and there was a crack in his voice as he spoke which told me that he also was strung to his tightest the luminous fog drifted slowly off the table and wavered and flickered across the room there in the farther and darkest corner it gathered and glowed hardening down into a shining core a strange shifty luminous and yet non-illuminating patch of radiance bright itself but throwing no rays into the darkness it had changed from a greenish yellow to a dusky sullen red then round this centre there coiled a dark smoky substance thickening hardening growing denser and blacker and then the light went out smothered in that which had grown round it it has gone hush there's something in the room we heard it in the corner where the light had been something which breathed deeply and fidgeted in the darkness what is it the duke what have you done it is all right no harm will come the frenchman's voice was a treble with agitation good heavens mar there's a large animal in the room 
here it is close by my chair go away go away it was harvey deacon's voice and then came the sound of a blow upon some hard object and then and and then how can i tell you what happened then some huge thing hurtled against us in the darkness rearing stamping smashing springing snorting the table was splintered we were scattered in every direction it clattered and scrambled amongst us rushing with horrible energy from one corner of the room to another we were all screaming with fear groveling upon our hands and knees to get away from it something trod upon my left hand and i felt the bones splinter under the weight a light a light someone yelled moira have you matches matches no i have none deacon where are the matches for god's sake the matches i, I can't find them here you frenchman stop it it is beyond me oh mon dieu i cannot stop it the door where is the door my hand by good luck lit upon the handle as i groped about in the darkness the hard breathing snorting rushing creature tore past me and butted with a fearful crash against the oaken partition the instant that it had passed i turned the handle and next moment we were all outside and the door shut behind us from within came a horrible crashing and rending and stamping what is it in heaven's name what is it a horse i saw it when the door opened but mrs delamere we must fetch her out come on markham the longer we wait the less we shall like it he flung open the door and we rushed in she was there on the ground amidst the splinters of her chair we seized her and dragged her swiftly out and as we gained the door i looked over my shoulder into the darkness there were two strange eyes glowing at us a rattle of hoofs and i had just time to slam the door when there came a crash upon it which split it from top to bottom it's coming through it's coming run run for your lives cried the frenchman another crash and something shot through the riven door it was a long white spike gleaming in the lamplight for a moment it shone before us and then with a snap it disappeared again quick quick this way harvey deacon shouted carry her in here quick we had taken refuge in the dining-room and shut the heavy oak door we laid the senseless woman upon the sofa and as we did so moir the hard man of business drooped and fainted across the hearth-rug harvey deacon was as white as a corpse jerking and twitching like an epileptic with a crash we heard the studio door fly to pieces and the snorting and stamping were in the passage up and down up and down shaking the house with their fury the frenchman had sunk his face on his hands and sobbed like a frightened child what shall we do i shook him roughly by the shoulder is a gun any use oh no no the power will pass then it will end you might have killed us all you unspeakable fool with your infernal experiments i did not know how could i tell that it would be frightened it is mad with terror it was his fault he struck it harvey deacon sprang up good heavens he cried a terrible scream sounded through the house it's my wife here i'm going out if it's the evil one himself i am going out he had thrown open the door and rushed out into the passage at the end of it at the foot of the stairs mrs deacon was lying senseless struck down by the sight which she had seen but there was nothing else with eyes of horror we looked about us but all was perfectly quiet and still i approached the black square of the studio door expecting with every slow step that some atrocious shape would hurl itself out of it but nothing came and all was silent inside the room peeping and peering our hearts in our mouths we came to the very threshold and stared into the darkness there was still no sound but in one direction there was also no darkness a luminous glowing cloud with an incandescent centre hovered in the corner of the room 
slowly it dimmed and faded growing thinner and fainter until at last the same dense velvety blackness filled the whole studio and with the last flickering gleam of that baleful light the frenchman broke into a shout of joy what a fun he cried no one is hurt and only the door broken and the ladies frightened but my friends we have done what has never been done before and as far as i can help it said harvey deacon it will certainly never be done again and that was what befell on the fourteenth of april last at number seventeen batterley gardens i began by saying that it would seem too grotesque to dogmatize as to what it was which actually did occur but i give my impressions our impressions since they are corroborated by harvey deacon and john moore for what they are worth you may if it pleases you imagine that we were the victims of an elaborate and extraordinary hoax or you may think with us that we underwent a very real and a very terrible experience or perhaps you may know more than we do of such occult matters and can inform us of similar occurrence in this latter case a letter to william markham one forty six m the albany would help to throw a light upon that which is very dark to us. End of story seven. Story eight of Round the Fire Stories by Arthur Conan Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story eight The Jew's Breastplate my particular friend ward mortimer was one of the best men of his day at everything connected with oriental archaeology he had written largely upon the subject he had lived two years in a tomb at thebes while he excavated in the valley of the kings and finally he had created a considerable sensation by his exhumation of the alleged mummy of cleopatra in the inner room of the temple of Horus at philae with such a record at the age of thirty-one it was felt that a considerable career lay before him and no one was surprised when he was elected to the curatorship of the belmore street museum which carries with it the lectureship at the oriental college and an income which has sunk with the fall in land but which still remains at that ideal sum which is large enough to encourage an investigator but not so large as to enervate him there was only one reason which made ward mortimer's position a little difficult at the belmore street museum and that was the extreme eminence of the man whom he had to succeed professor andreas was a profound scholar and a man of european reputation his lectures were frequented by students from every part of the world and his admirable management of the collection entrusted to his care was a commonplace in all learned societies there was therefore considerable surprise when at the age of fifty-five he suddenly resigned his position and retired from those duties which had been both his livelihood and his pleasure he and his daughter left the comfortable suite of rooms which had formed his official residence in connection with the museum and my friend mortimer who was a bachelor took up his quarters there on hearing of mortimer's appointment professor andreas had written him a very kindly and flattering congratulatory letter i was actually present at their first meeting and i went with mortimer round the museum when the professor showed us the admirable collection which he had cherished so long the professor's beautiful daughter and a young man captain wilson who was as i understood soon to be her husband accompanied us in our inspection there were fifteen rooms but the babylonian the syrian and the central hall which contained the jewish and egyptian collection were the finest of all professor andreas was a quiet dry elderly man with a clean-shaven face and an impassive manner but his dark eyes sparkled and his features quickened into enthusiastic life as he pointed out to us the rarity and the beauty of some of his specimens his hand lingered so fondly over them that one could read his pride in them and the grief in his heart now that they were passing from his care into that of another 
He had shown us in turn his mummies, his papyri, his rare scarabs, his inscriptions, his Jewish relics, and his duplication of the famous seven-branched candlestick of the temple, which was brought to Rome by Titus, and which is supposed by some to be lying at this instant in the bed of the Tiber. Then he approached a case which stood in the very centre of the hall, and he looked down through the glass with reverence in his attitude and manner. "'This is no novelty to an expert like yourself, Mr. Mortimer,' said he, "'but I dare say that your friend Mr. Jackson will be interested to see it.' Leaning over the case I saw an object, some five inches square, which consisted of twelve precious stones in a framework of gold, with golden hooks at two of the corners. The stones were all varying in sort and color, but they were of the same size. Their shapes, arrangement, and gradation of tint made me think of a box of watercolor paints. Each stone had some hieroglyphic scratched upon its surface. You have heard, Mr. Jackson, of the Urim and Thummim? I had heard the term, but my idea of its meaning was exceedingly vague. The Urim and Thummim was a name given to the jeweled plate which lay upon the breast of the high priest of the Jews. They had a very special feeling of reverence for it, something of the feeling which an ancient Roman might have for the Sibylline books in the capital. There are, as you see, twelve magnificent stones inscribed with mystical characters. Counting from the left-hand top corner, the stones are carnelian, peridot, emerald, ruby, lapis lazuli, onyx, sapphire, agate, amethyst, topaz, beryl, and jasper. I was amazed at the variety and beauty of the stones. Has the breastplate any particular history? I asked. It is of great age and of immense value, said Professor Andreas. Without being able to make an absolute assertion, we have many reasons to think that it is possible that it may be the original Urim and Thummim of Solomon's temple. There is certainly nothing so fine in any collection in Europe my friend captain wilson here is a practical authority upon precious stones and he would tell you how pure these are captain wilson a man with a dark hard incisive face was standing beside his fiancee at the other side of the case yes he said curtly i have never seen finer stones and the gold work is also worthy of attention the ancients excelled in he was apparently about to indicate the setting of the stones when Captain Wilson interrupted him. "'You will see a finer example of their gold work in this candlestick,' said he, turning to another table, and we all joined him in his admiration of its embossed stem and delicately ornamented branches. Altogether it was an interesting and a novel experience to have objects of such rarity explained by so great an expert.' and when finally Professor Andreas finished our inspection by formally handing over the precious collection to the care of my friend, I could not help pitying him and envying his successor, whose life was to pass in so pleasant a duty. Within a week Ward Mortimer was duly installed in his new set of rooms, and had become the autocrat of the Belmore Street Museum. About a fortnight afterwards my friend gave a small dinner to half a dozen bachelor friends to celebrate his promotion. When his guests were departing he pulled my sleeve and signaled to me that he wished me to remain. "'You have only a few hundred yards to go,' said he. I was living in chambers in the Albany. "'You may as well stay and have a quiet cigar with me. I very much want your advice.' I relapsed into an armchair and lit one of his excellent matronas. When he had returned from seeing the last of his guests out, he drew a letter from his dress jacket and sat down opposite to me. "'This is an anonymous letter which I received this morning,' said he. "'I want to read it to you and to have your advice. You are very welcome to it for what it is worth. This is how the note runs. Sir, I should strongly advise you to keep a very careful watch over the many valuable things which are committed to your charge. I do not think that the present system of a single watchman is sufficient. Be upon your guard, or an irreparable misfortune may occur. Is that all? Yes, that is all. 
well said i it is at least obvious that it was written by one of the limited number of people who are aware that you have only one watchman at night ward mortimer handed me the note with a curious smile have you an eye for handwriting said he now look at this he put another letter in front of me look at the c in congratulate and the c in committed look at the capital i look at the trick of putting in a dash instead of a stop they are undoubtedly from the same hand with some attempt at disguise in the case of this first one the second said ward mortimer is the letter of congratulation which was written to me by professor andreas upon my obtaining my appointment i stared at him in amazement then i turned over the letter in my hand and there sure enough was martin andreas signed upon the other side there could be no doubt in the mind of any one who had the slightest knowledge of the science of graphology that the professor had written an anonymous letter warning his successor against thieves it was inexplicable but it was certain why should he do it i asked precisely what i should wish to ask you if he had any such misgivings why could he not come and tell me direct will you speak to him about it there again i am in doubt he might choose to deny that he wrote it at any rate said i this warning is meant in a friendly spirit and i should certainly act upon it are the present precautions enough to ensure you against robbery i should have thought so the public are only admitted from ten till five and there is a guardian to every two rooms he stands at the door between them and so commands them both but at night when the public are gone we at once put up the great iron shutters which are absolutely burglar proof the watchman is a capable fellow he sits in the lodge but he walks round every three hours we keep one electric light burning in each room all night it is difficult to suggest anything more short of keeping your day watchers all night we could not afford that at least i should communicate with the police and have a special constable put on outside in belmore street said i as to the letter if the writer wishes to be anonymous i think he has a right to remain so we must trust to the future to show some reason for the curious course which he has adopted so we dismissed the subject but all that night after my return to my chambers i was puzzling my brain as to what possible motive professor andreas could have for writing an anonymous warning letter to his successor for that the writing was his was as certain to me as if i had seen him actually doing it he foresaw some danger to the collection was it because he foresaw it that he abandoned his charge of it but if so why should he hesitate to warn mortimer in his own name i puzzled and puzzled until at last i fell into a troubled sleep which carried me beyond my usual hour of rising i was aroused in a singular and effective method for about nine o'clock my friend mortimer rushed into my room with an expression of consternation upon his face he was usually one of the most tidy men of my acquaintance but now his collar was undone at one end his tie was flying and his hat at the back of his head i read his whole story in his frantic eyes the museum has been robbed i cried springing up in bed i fear so those jewels the jewels of the urim and thummim he gasped for he was out of breath with running i'm going on to the police station come to the museum as soon as you can jackson good-bye he rushed distractedly out of the room and i heard him clatter down the stairs i was not long in following his directions but i found when i arrived that he had already returned with a police inspector and another elderly gentleman who proved to be mr purvis one of the partners of morson and company the well-known diamond merchants as an expert in stones he was always prepared to advise the police they were grouped around the case in which the breastplate of the jewish priest had been exposed the plate had been taken out and laid upon the glass top of the case and the three heads were bent over it it is obvious that it has been tampered with said mortimer it caught my eye the moment i passed through the room this morning 
I examined it yesterday evening, so that it is certain that this has happened during the night. It was, as he had said, obvious that someone had been at work upon it. The settings of the uppermost row of four stones, the carnelian, peridot, emerald, and ruby, were rough and jagged, as if someone had scraped all around them. The stones were in their places, but the beautiful gold work, which we had admired only a few days before, had been very clumsily pulled about. It looks to me, said the police inspector, as if someone had been trying to take out the stones. My fear is, said Mortimer, that he not only tried, but succeeded. I believe these four stones to be skillful imitations, which have been put in the place of the originals. The same suspicion had evidently been in the mind of the expert, for he had been carefully examining the four stones with the aid of a lens. He now submitted them to several tests, and finally turned cheerfully to Mortimer. "'I congratulate you, sir,' said he heartily. "'I will pledge my reputation that all four of these stones are genuine and of a most unusual degree of purity.' The color began to come back to my poor friend's frightened face, and he drew a long breath of relief. "'Thank God!' he cried. "'Then what in the world did the thief want? Probably he meant to take the stones, but was interrupted. In that case one would expect him to take them out one at a time, but the setting of each of these has been loosened, and yet the stones are all here.' it is certainly most extraordinary said the inspector i never remember a case like it let us see the watchman the commissionaire was called a soldierly honest-faced man who seemed as concerned as ward mortimer at the incident no sir i never heard a sound he answered in reply to the questions of the inspector i made my rounds four times as usual but i saw nothing suspicious I've been in my position ten years, but nothing of the kind has ever occurred before. No thief could have come through the windows? Impossible, sir. Or passed you at the door? No, sir, I never left my post except when I walked my rounds. What other openings are there in the museum? Well, there is the door into Mr. Ward Mortimer's private rooms. That is locked at night, my friend explained, and in order to reach it, any one from the street would have to open the outside door as well. Your servants? Their quarters are entirely separate. Well, well, said the inspector, this is certainly very obscure. However, there has been no harm done, according to Mr. Purvis. I will swear that these stones are genuine. So that the case appears to be merely one of malicious damage, but none the less I should be very glad to go carefully round the premises and to see if we can find any trace to show us who your visitor may have been. His investigation, which lasted all the morning, was careful and intelligent, but it led in the end to nothing. He pointed out to us that there were two possible entrances to the museum which we had not considered. The one was from the cellars by a trap-door opening in the passage the other threw a skylight from the lumber-room, overlooking that very chamber to which the intruder had penetrated. As neither the cellar nor the lumber-room could be entered unless the thief was already within the locked doors, the matter was not of any practical importance, and the dust of cellar and attic assured us that no one had used either one or the other. Finally we ended as we began, without the slightest clue as to how, why or by whom the setting of these four jewels had been tampered with. There remained one course for Mortimer to take, and he took it. Leaving the police to continue their fruitless researches, he asked me to accompany him that afternoon in a visit to Professor Andreas. He took with him the two letters, and it was his intention to openly tax his predecessor with having written the anonymous warning, and to ask him to explain the fact that he should have anticipated so exactly that which had actually occurred. The professor was living in a small villa in Upper Norwood, but we were informed by the servant that he was away from home. Seeing our disappointment, she asked us if we would like to see Miss Andreas, and showed us into the modest drawing-room. I have mentioned, incidentally, that the professor's daughter was a very beautiful girl. 
She was a blonde, tall and graceful, with a skin of that delicate tint which the French call mat, the color of old ivory, or of the lighter petals of the sulphur rose. I was shocked, however, as she entered the room, to see how much she had changed in the last fortnight. Her young face was haggard, and her bright eyes heavy with trouble. "'Father has gone to Scotland,' she said. "'He seems to be tired, and has had a good deal to worry him. He only left us yesterday.' "'You look a little tired yourself, Miss Andreas,' said my friend. "'I have been so anxious about father. Can you give me his Scotch address?' yes he is with his brother the reverend david andreas one aaron villas ardrassen ward mortimer made a note of the address and we left without saying anything as to the object of our visit we found ourselves in belmore street in the evening in exactly the same position in which we had been in the morning our only clue was the professor's letter and my friend had made up his mind to start for ardrossen the next day and to get to the bottom of the anonymous letter when a new development came to alter our plans very early on the following morning i was aroused from my sleep by a tap upon my bedroom door it was a messenger with a note from mortimer do come round it said the matter is becoming more and more extraordinary when i obeyed his summons i found him pacing excitedly up and down the central room while the old soldier who guarded the premises stood with military stiffness in a corner. "'My dear Jackson,' he cried, "'I am so delighted that you have come, for this is a most inexplicable business.' "'What has happened, then?' He waved his hands toward the case which contained the breastplate. "'Look at it,' said he. I did so, and could not restrain a cry of surprise. The setting of the middle row of precious stones had been profaned in the same manner as the upper ones. Of the twelve jewels, eight had been now tampered with in this singular fashion. The setting of the lower four was neat and smooth, the others jagged and irregular. "'Have the stones been altered?' I asked. "'No, I am certain that these upper four are the same which the expert pronounced to be genuine, for I observed yesterday that little discoloration on the edge of the emerald. Since they have not extracted the upper stones, there is no reason to think the lower have been transposed. You say that you heard nothing, Simpson?' "'No, sir,' the commissionaire answered. "'But when I made my round after daylight, I had a special look at these stones.' and I saw at once that someone had been meddling with them. Then I called you, sir, and told you. I was backwards and forwards all the night, and I never saw a soul or heard a sound. "'Come up and have some breakfast with me,' said Mortimer, and he took me into his own chambers. "'Now what do you think of this, Jackson?' he asked. "'It is the most objectless, futile, idiotic business that ever I heard of.' It can only be the work of a monomaniac. Can you put forward any theory? A curious idea came into my head. This object is a Jewish relic of great antiquity and sanctity, said I. How about the anti-Semitic movement? Could one conceive that a fanatic of that way of thinking might desecrate? Oh, no, 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 cried Mortimer. That will never do. Such a man might push his lunacy to the length of destroying a Jewish relic, but why on earth would he nibble round every stone so carefully that he can only do four stones in a night? We must have a better solution than that, and we must find it for ourselves, for do not think that our inspector is likely to help us. First of all, what do you think of Simpson, the porter? Well, have you any reason to suspect him? Only that he is the one person on the premises— but why should he indulge in such wanton destruction? Nothing has been taken away. He has no motive. Mania? No, I will swear to his sanity. Have you any other theory? Well, yourself, for example. You are not a somnambulist by any chance. Nothing of the sort, I assure you. Then I give up. But I don't, and I have a plan by which we will make it all clear to visit Professor Andreas? No, we shall find our solution nearer than Scotland. I will tell you what we shall do. 
You know that skylight which overlooks the central hall? We will leave the electric lights in the hall, and we will keep watch in the lumber room, you and I, and solve the mystery for ourselves. If our mysterious visitor is doing four stones at a time, he has four still to do, and there is every reason to think that he will return to-night and complete the job. Excellent! I cried. We will keep our own secret and say nothing either to the police or to Simpson. Will you join me? With the utmost pleasure, said I, and so it was agreed. It was ten o'clock that night when I returned to the Belmore Street Museum. Mortimer was, as I could see, in a state of suppressed nervous excitement, but it was still too early to begin our vigil, so we remained for an hour or so in his chambers, discussing all the possibilities of the singular business which we had met to solve. At last the roaring stream of hansom cabs and the rush of hurrying feet became lower and more intermittent as the pleasure-seekers passed on their way to their stations or their homes. It was nearly twelve when Mortimer led the way to the lumber-room which overlooked the central hall of the museum. He had visited it during the day and had spread some sacking so that we could lie at our ease and look straight down into the museum. The skylight was of unfrosted glass, but was so covered with dust that it would be impossible for anyone looking up from below to detect that he was overlooked. We cleared a small piece at each corner which gave us a complete view of the room beneath us. In the cold white light of the electric lamps everything stood out hard and clear, and I could see the smallest detail of the contents of the various cases. Such a vigil is an excellent lesson, since one has no choice but to look hard at those objects which we usually pass with such half-hearted interest. Through my little peephole I employed the hours in studying every specimen, from the huge mummy-case which leaned against the wall to those very jewels which had brought us there, gleaming and sparkling in their glass case immediately beneath us. There was much precious gold work and many valuable stones scattered through the numerous cases, but those wonderful twelve which made up the Urim and Thummim glowed and burned with a radiance which far eclipsed the others. I studied in turn the tomb pictures of Sikara, the friezes from Karnak, the statues of Memphis, and the inscriptions of Thebes, but my eyes would always come back to that wonderful Jewish relic and my mind to the singular mystery which surrounded it. I was lost in the thought of it when my companion suddenly drew his breath sharply in and seized my arm in a convulsive grip. At the same instant I saw what it was which had excited him. I have said that against the wall, on the right-hand side of the doorway, the right-hand side as we looked at it, but the left as one entered, there stood a large mummy-case. To our unutterable amazement it was slowly opening. Gradually, gradually, the lid was swinging back, and the black slit which marked the opening was becoming wider and wider. So gently and carefully was it done that the movement was almost imperceptible. Then, as we breathlessly watched it, a white, thin hand appeared at the opening, pushing back the painted lid then another hand, and finally a face, a face which was familiar to us both, that of Professor Andreas. Stealthily he slunk out of the mummy-case, like a fox stealing from its burrow, his head turning incessantly to left and to right, stepping, then pausing, then stepping again, the very image of craft and of caution. Once some sound in the street struck him motionless, and he stood listening, with his ear turned, ready to dart back to the shelter behind him. Then he crept onwards again upon tiptoe, very, very, softly and slowly, until he had reached the case in the center of the room. There he took a bunch of keys from his pocket, unlocked the case, took out the Jewish breastplate, and laying it upon the glass in front of him began to work upon it with some sort of small glistening tool. He was so directly underneath us that his bent head covered his work, 
but we could guess from the movement of his hand that he was engaged in finishing the strange disfigurement which he had begun i could realize from the heavy breathing of my companion and the twitchings of the hand which still clutched my wrist the furious indignation which filled his heart as he saw this vandalism in the quarter of all others where he could least have expected it he the very man who a fortnight before had reverently bent over this unique relic and who had impressed its antiquity and its sanctity upon us was now engaged in this outrageous profanation it was impossible unthinkable and yet there in the white glare of the electric light beneath us was that dark figure with the bent gray head and the twitching elbow what inhuman hypocrisy what hateful depth of malice against his successor must underlie these sinister nocturnal labors it was painful to think of and dreadful to watch even i who had none of the acute feelings of a virtuoso could not bear to look on and see this deliberate mutilation of so ancient a relic it was a relief to me when my companion tugged at my sleeve as a signal that i was to follow him as he softly crept out of the room it was not until we were within his own quarters that he opened his lips and then i saw by his agitated face how deep was his consternation the abominable goth he cried could you have believed it it is amazing he is a villain or a lunatic one or the other we shall very soon see which come with me jackson and we shall get to the bottom of this black business a door opened out of the passage which was the private entrance from his rooms into the museum this he opened softly with his key having first kicked off his shoes an example which i followed we crept together through room after room until the large hall lay before us with that dark figure still stooping and working at the central case with an advance as cautious as his own we closed in upon him but softly as we went we could not take him entirely unawares we were still a dozen yards from him when he looked round with a start and uttering a husky cry of terror ran frantically down the museum simpson simpson roared mortimer and far away down the vista of electric lighted doors we saw the stiff figure of the old soldier suddenly appear professor andreas saw him also and stopped running with a gesture of despair at the same instant we each laid a hand upon his shoulder yes yes gentlemen he panted i will come with you T to your room mr ward mortimer if you please i feel that i owe you an explanation my companion's indignation was so great that i could see that he dared not trust himself to reply we walked on each side of the old professor the astonished commissionaire bringing up the rear when we reached the violated case mortimer stopped and examined the breastplate already one of the stones of the lower row had had its setting turned back in the same manner as the others my friend held it up and glanced furiously at his prisoner how could you he cried how could you it is horrible horrible said the professor i don't wonder at your feelings take me to your room but this shall not be left exposed cried mortimer he picked the breastplate up and carried it tenderly in his hand while i walked beside the professor like a policeman with a malefactor we passed into mortimer's chambers leaving the amazed old soldier to understand the matter as best he could the professor sat down in mortimer's armchair and turned so ghastly a colour that for the instant all our resentment was changed to concern a stiff glass of brandy brought the life back to him once more there i am better now said he these last few days have been too much for me i am convinced that i could not stand it any longer it is a nightmare a horrible nightmare that i should be arrested as a burglar in what has been for so long my own museum and yet i cannot blame you you could not have done otherwise my hope always was that i should get it all over with before i was detected this would have been my last night's work 
"'How did you get in?' asked Mortimer. "'By taking a very great liberty with your private door. But the object justified it. The object justified everything. You will not be angry when you know everything. At least you will not be angry with me. I had a key to your side door, and also to the museum door. I did not give them up when I left, and so, you see, it was not difficult for me to let myself into the museum. I used to come in early before the crowd had cleared from the street. Then I hid myself in the mummy case and took refuge there whenever Simpson came round. I could always hear him coming. I used to leave in the same way as I came. You ran a risk. I had to. But why? What on earth was your object? You to do a thing like that? Mortimer pointed reproachfully at the plate which lay before him on the table. I could devise no other means. I thought and thought but there was no alternative except a hideous public scandal and a private sorrow which would have clouded our lives. I acted for the best, incredible as it may seem to you, and I only ask your attention to enable me to prove it. I will hear what you have to say before I take any further steps, said Mortimer grimly. I am determined to hold back nothing and to take you both completely into my confidence. I will leave it to your own generosity how far you will use the facts with which I supply you. We have the essential facts already, and yet you understand nothing. Let me go back to what passed a few weeks ago, and I will make it all clear to you. Believe me that what I say is the absolute and exact truth. You have met the person who calls himself Captain Wilson. I say calls himself because I have reason now to believe that is not his correct name. It would take me too long if I were to describe all the means by which he obtained an introduction to me and ingratiated himself into my friendship and the affection of my daughter. He brought letters from foreign colleagues which compelled me to show him some attention and then by his own attainments which are considerable he succeeded in making himself a very welcome visitor at my rooms when i learned that my daughter's affections had been gained by him i may have thought it premature but i certainly was not surprised for he had a charm of manner and of conversation which would have made him conspicuous in any society he was much interested in oriental antiquities, and his knowledge of the subject justified his entrance. Often when he spent the evening with us he would ask permission to go down into the museum and have an opportunity of privately inspecting the various specimens. You can imagine that I, as an enthusiast, was in sympathy with such a request, and that I felt no surprise at the constancy of his visits. After his actual engagement to Elise there was hardly an evening which he did not pass with us, and an hour or two were generally devoted to the museum. He had the free run of the place, and when I have been away for the evening I had no objection to his doing whatever he wished there. This state of things was only terminated by the fact of my resignation of my official duties and my retirement to Norwood, where I hoped to have the leisure to write a considerable work which I had planned. It was immediately after this, within a week or so, that I first realized the true nature and character of the man whom I had so imprudently introduced into my family. The discovery came to me through letters from my friends abroad, which showed me that his introductions to me had been forgeries. Aghast at the revelation, I asked myself what motive this man could originally have had in practicing this elaborate deception upon me. I was too poor a man for any fortune-hunter to have marked me down. Why, then, had he come? I remembered that some of the most precious gems in Europe had been under my charge, and I remembered also the ingenious excuses by which this man had made himself familiar with the cases in which they were kept. He was a rascal who was planning some gigantic robbery. How could I, without striking my own daughter, who was infatuated about him, prevent him from carrying out any plan which he might have formed? 
My device was a clumsy one, and yet I could think of nothing more effective. If I had written a letter under my own name, you would naturally have turned to me for details which I did not wish to give. I resorted to an anonymous letter, begging you to be upon your guard. I may tell you that my change from Belmore Street to Norwood had not affected the visits of this man, who had, I believe, a real and overpowering affection for my daughter. As to her, I could not have believed that any woman could be so completely under the influence of a man as she was. His stronger nature seemed to entirely dominate her. I had not realized how far this was the case, or the extent of the confidence which existed between them, until that very evening when his true character for the first time was made clear to me. I had given orders that when he called he should be shown into my study instead of to the drawing-room. Then I told him bluntly that I knew about him, that I had taken steps to defeat his designs, and that neither I nor my daughter desired ever to see him again. I added that I thanked God that I had found him out before he had time to harm those precious objects which it had been the work of my lifetime to protect. He was certainly a man of iron nerve. He took my remarks without a sign either of surprise or of defiance, but he listened gravely and attentively until I had finished. Then he walked across the room without a word and struck the bell. "'Ask Miss Andreas to be so kind as to step this way,' said he to the servant. My daughter entered, and the man closed the door behind her. Then he took her hand in his. "'Elise,' said he, "'your father has just discovered that I am a villain. He knows now what you knew before.' She stood in silence, listening. "'He says that we are to part forever,' said he. She did not withdraw her hand. "'Will you be true to me, or will you remove the last good influence which is ever likely to come into my life?' john she cried passionately i will never abandon you never never not if the whole world were against you in vain i argued and pleaded with her it was absolutely useless her whole life was bound up in this man before me my daughter gentlemen is all that i have left to love and it filled me with agony when i saw how powerless i was to save her from her ruin my helplessness seemed to touch this man, who was the cause of my trouble. "'It may not be as bad as you think, sir,' he said, in his quiet, inflexible way. "'I love Elise with a love which is strong enough to rescue even one who has such a record as I have. It was but yesterday that I promised her that never again in my whole life would I do a thing of which she would be ashamed.' I have made up my mind to it, and never yet did I make up my mind to a thing which I did not do. He spoke with an air which carried conviction with it. As he concluded, he put his hand into his pocket, and he drew out a small cardboard box. I am about to give you proof of my determination, said he. This Elise will be the first fruits of your redeeming influence over me. You are right, sir, in thinking that I had designs upon the jewels in your possession. Such ventures have had a charm for me, which depended as much upon the risk run as upon the value of the prize. Those famous and antique stones of the Jewish priest were a challenge to my daring and my ingenuity. I determined to get them. I guessed as much. There was only one thing that you did not guess, and what is that? that I got them. They are in this box. He opened the box and tilted out the contents upon the corner of my desk. My hair rose and my flesh grew cold as I looked. There were twelve magnificent square stones engraved with mystical characters. There could be no doubt that they were the jewels of the Urim and Thummim. Good God! I cried. How have you escaped discovery? by the substitution of twelve others, made especially to my order, in which the originals are so carefully imitated that I defy the eye to detect the difference. Then the present stones are false, I cried. They have been for some weeks. We all stood in silence, my daughter white with emotion, but still holding this man by the hand. 
"'You see what I am capable of, Elise,' said he. "'I see that you are capable of repentance and restitution,' she answered. "'Yes, thanks to your influence. I leave the stones in your hands, sir. Do what you like about it. But remember that whatever you do against me is done against the future husband of your only daughter. You will hear from me soon again, Elise. It is the last time that I will ever cause pain to your tender heart. And with these words he left both the room and the house. My position was a dreadful one. Here I was with these precious relics in my possession, and how could I return them without a scandal and an exposure? I knew the depth of my daughter's nature too well to suppose that I would ever be able to detach her from this man now that she had entirely given him her heart. I was not even sure how far it was right to detach her if she had such an ameliorating influence over him. How could I expose him without injuring her? And how far was I justified in exposing him when he had voluntarily put himself into my power? I thought and thought until at last I formed a resolution which may seem to you to be a foolish one, and yet if I had to do it again, I believe it would be the best course open to me. My idea was to return the stones without any one being the wiser. With my keys I could get into the museum at any time, and I was confident that I could avoid Simpson, whose hours and methods were familiar to me. I determined to take no one into my confidence, not even my daughter, whom I told that I was about to visit my brother in Scotland. I wanted a free hand for a few nights, without inquiry as to my comings and goings. To this end I took a room in Harding Street that very night, and with an intimation that I was a pressman, and that I should keep very late hours. That night I made my way into the museum, and replaced four of the stones. It was hard work, and took me all night. When Simpson came round I always heard his footsteps, and concealed myself in the mummy case. I had some knowledge of gold work, but was far less skilful than the thief had been. He had replaced the setting so exactly that I defy any one to see the difference. My work was rude and clumsy. However, I hoped that the plate might not be carefully examined, or the roughness of the setting observed, until my task was done. Next night I replaced four more stones, and tonight I should have finished my task, had it not been for the unfortunate circumstance which has caused me to reveal so much which I should have wished to keep concealed. I appeal to you, gentlemen, to your sense of honour and of compassion, whether what I have told you should go any further or not. My own happiness, my daughter's future, the hopes of this man's regeneration, all depend upon your decision. Which is, said my friend, that all is well that ends well, and that the whole matter ends here and at once. Tomorrow the loose setting shall be tightened by an expert goldsmith, and so passes the greatest danger to which, since the destruction of the temple, the Urim and Thummim have been exposed. Here is my hand, Professor Andreas, and I can only hope that under such difficult circumstances I should have carried myself as unselfishly and as well. Just one footnote to this narrative. Within a month Elise Andreas was married to a man whose name, had I the indiscretion to mention it, would appeal to my readers as one who is now widely and deservedly honoured. But if the truth were known, that honour is due not to him, but to the gentle girl who plucked him back when he had gone so far down that dark road along which few return. End of Story 8